It's chaos. It's a different type of Sunday scary. It's your newest obsession. It's Dirty Driving, a Formula One podcast. We're the Hornsby sisters. I'm Katie. And I'm Megan. (laughs) Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello. It's the end of the year. Let's do this, bitch. It's the absolute end of the year. It's the last episode of Dirty Driving for the season. And here we are. We do have some updates in this past week. There's been quite a lot that's happened more on the drama side of the sport. But before we get into that, there were two big things that have happened. One is the Autosport Awards. And the second is that literally just this morning before we started recording it was announced where we will be taking or where the sprint races will be taking place for 2023 so in the auto sport awards our good friend seb won the gregor grant lifetime achievement award when he got up on stage he did an impersonation of carlos Sainz, and then had a stand-up comedy moment when he talked about the fact that he was bidding to buy his side pod back and had no idea that Aston Martin had put it up for auction. So cute little moment and hopefully not the last moment we get of, of Seb in 2022 and early 2023. Max won the International Racing Driver of the Year and Zhao took Rookie of the Year. He was the only one, so that was a little it obvious. Feels- pretty stupid that they give that award out when there is one rookie like i know that would be even truthfully okay look it would be even more stupid if they randomly didn't have it one year like if you look back at the history books but it feels really stupid in the moment to give out rookie of the year award when there is only one only one rookie and uh, this is a popular opinion. Like, I think they should have thrown DeVere's in the like hat in the ring for that because of his one race. And I kind of think it would have been an actual competition between the two of them if DeVere's had been involved because so many people were sucked into his success that race. I know I was. <laughs> yeah, it just seems um, obvious. Like, to call him up on stage, Christian presented the award and like, I think paused and then was like, it shall. <laughs> and everyone that was like, was uncomfortable. And everyone was like, yeah, we know. Uh, so yeah, that's, that was that George. We can't, oh, we can't oh. fault Christian for being weird though. They literally put him at table 44 and whoever in the auto sports seat, I, I swear whoever did the seating chart isn't is team Lewis Hamilton because no. that was that. That is, if that was not planned for that photo, then the world really has some fucked up karma in it. <laughs> it, it was, it had to have been planned. There, I, no way the karma is that strong. Actually, karma could be that strong. I guarantee it. But I think that was some secret planning by someone, which good on them. It gave F1 Twitter a good laugh. That's for sure. Unless that was the marketing department's massive ploy to get photos of the Autosport Award going everywhere. And if that if that was it, give that marketing person a raise. All a the money. Raise. Oh. All the money. Oh. What, how much you have? Double it. <laughs> <laughs> and then George won moment of the year with his Sao Paulo GP win. Not only did he look spiffy, but so did his date, his girlfriend, Carmen. And they gave us like a whole get ready with me photo shoot moment, which just sent the world in a tizzy. Like there's one photo of Carmen fixing his, I don't even know what it's called. The waist, his belt. waistcoat. Yeah. Waistcoat. Thank you. And it's like, This is the photo of the two of them. And I'm like, guys, they're literally in a bathroom getting ready. (laughs) Like, No, it is the photo. It is, it is literally one of the greatest social media. I will stand by this. That is one of the greatest social media photos and not for its comedy factor, because it's one of those photos that is like timeless in 50 years. That picture will be still amazing. Like, look, I love the VB butt photos and I love the mullet. 
But both of those things, if there was a photo of them in 50 years, it, people would laugh at it. Whereas like the George Russell can't Carmen picture, like you could blow that up and put it on a wall. And that is art. They're a different kind of iconic. <laughs> I, I will give it to you. I will. I am fully on board now that you have artfully explained that it is an iconic photo, but they have plenty of time left, fingers crossed. So maybe we'll get some more. Iconic I don't photos. know. I don't know. Don't worry. We'll get into that in a minute. We will. Get Charles into and that Charlotte gave us an iconic photo at Abu Dhabi. And here we are. Here we are. You know what well, photo I'm talking about when he's leaning in to like the mass and she's there and they're kissing and you're like, that's love. That's yeah. love. It's every like F1 fans dream, I think, to be in her place maybe not every f1 fan stream whatever and that photo was iconic and now we have this news let's skip we got to skip to it like let's what are these in, what are these instagram stories yeah it's the what all, are these instagram stories it's the all black screen with the white writing you know what's happening like i woke up that morning i think it was it was tuesday morning or monday morning one of the mornings i don't remember and I get the, my Twitter notifications, you know, and it's like, Charles has broken up with Charlotte. And I'm like, I'm like, what? Like, no, this can't be, this has to be fake Four people. news, fake news for sure. Go to, go to straight to the source. I'm not clicking on that Twitter notification. I'm going straight to the source. I'm going to Charles Leclerc's Instagram story. And sure enough, there it is. The black screen with the white writing and. Yeah, people were texting me. People who I didn't even know were at Formula 7 1. 15. I had four text messages, Katie. Yeah. Did you From see the news? I was like, I'm sorry. You guys are choosing violence this morning. You should have just let me stumble upon this. Yeah. I did I did not need to be texted about that. I got Twitter notified by the masses immediately upon wake up and my day was ruined and I screenshotted it and sent it to Megan and I don't think I said anything. I just left the screenshot there for her to comment on. I, okay. Here are my thoughts. Here are my thoughts. Thank you for just saying it instead of all of us having to figure it out. And yeah. by all of us, I mean those in the internet because I don't spend that much time trying to figure out who's broken up with who. So thank you for just getting it out there and we can just move on and acceptance. Secondly, does it have to be a black screen with white writing? Because that is becoming symbolic with like, not symbolic. That's not the right word. It's becoming a bit dramatic. Yeah. I think if you could have posted a lovely photo of yourselves and just said something underneath it. Oh my God. No, that'd be worse. That would be way worse. Of I'm them sorry. best friends. I mean, literally Charles, it just is aggressive. It's much too aggressive. The, it's like a prison note, aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. It, it could have been done more gently. We'll put it it's that just, way. I, like, who are we going to see in the paddock now? Because Charles and Charlotte aren't together. Lando and Lucia Lisa. aren't together. Yeah, Lisa. they're gone. They're gone. I mean, thank God we have Tiffany and Valtteri. Ugh, yeah. I mean, let's, and we let's, have Carmen and George. Yeah. That's really all we need. Lewis and his car. That's who he's in a relationship with. I volunteer as tribute. I volunteer as tribute. Sign me up, Lewis. I'll become vegan. I'll quit onions for you. And I'll I mean, never eat butter again. We've got, at least we've got Carlando. I mean, they were spotted at that wedding together. We're hoping for more content from them next year. I mean... We've got the two of them as well. We, we have a lot. We have a lot going on. But most importantly, we have VB serving. He is, he is truly in, in the relationship for him. And he is fully embracing himself because he has an excellent hockey video out there that I maybe watched like five times too many. And we have the mullet video and he the mustache this year 
I mean, those are like, and if you include the butt photos, that's like four stellar things about Valtteri that is coming from being in a healthy, loving, and free expression relationship, which things we love to see. And honestly, Tiffany's fucking awesome. She was in that video with him getting a mullet. Was like, yeah, do it. I don't care as long as you're happy. That's what we want to hear. That is what we want to hear. And he actually rocks it. Like I have been anti mullet, but well, it's like a it's like a short mullet. It's not over the top. It's not aggressive. It's it's serving mullet, but it's not serving mullet. Like when it's, I look at it immediately, I'm not, I'm not like repulsed oh, and think bolt. I met NASCAR. Yes. It's more <laughs> like, oh. Just kidding. I'm, I'm not shaving NASCAR. I'm just saying that's where I've seen all the mullets in my life. I'm like, oh, I, I see the growth potential. We can keep it tame. You know, it's not bad. It's like business professional in the front, party in the back, but not too much of a party. Just like. A friend's giving in the back. I like that. A Sunday, <laughs> a Sunday tea party, if you will, even. <laughs> in other other news, before we jump into the sprint races, we saw all the action of Lewis in Egypt. It was his first time there. He was at the Dior fashion show. We saw him running, not running, he was quickly walking through some underground tunnel, which I have to assume that's one of the pyramids, but it was not descriptive enough to know. So he's just my favorite iconic moment from the whole social media storm of Lewis in Egypt is he took a picture of the runway of one of the models walking on the runway and he just captioned it. I need this, the fit that the model was wearing. And I was just like, to be Lewis Hamilton at the Dior fashion show in Egypt in front of the pyramids and be shopping for your next season wardrobe. It's just, it's just phenomenal. I'm so, I'm, I just love him. I love the energy, no matter what. It's just great energy for him. It's so funny that that was your favorite moment. And mine was when there's a video of him, like getting off the golf cart and like, like not running, but like jogging to take a photo. And he's like holding his phone and he's like, who do I give my phone? Oh, here, phone. <laughs> Pose for the photo. Like, holy shit. So you're telling me you just like scrambled off of a go-kart gracefully, forgot that you held your phone, freaked out about it, and then pa paused and took like a perfect photo. I'm sorry. I would have needed like 17 people to get me ready for that moment. And I would have needed, and he just does it effortlessly. It's like, pose. Once you got your poses down. He's literally... And he's, yeah, it, it's just unfair. He's he's got his poses down. He does. And then the the last thing I feel that I need to comment on, and Megan, feel free to continue if you've got some other things. But the last thing that I need to share is Lando Norris growing or attempting to grow some facial hair. I but just he's playing golf well. Yeah, I, I just think the facial hair is helping. I. I'm not sure about that or the facial hair. <laughs> did he but, DJ at the wedding? I think he did. I think he did. I, I His DJ career is a little, so it was way funnier when he was just like DJing at like Formula One driver events and random clubs. Now he's playing weddings. He's a wedding DJ. Can I hire him? I, yeah. What's the going rate? for five hours of entertainment of, of Lando Norris. Like someone tell me and I will book him for your birthday party tomorrow. Like, honestly, let's see, let's, let's see these skills. I it just, I can't imagine like he comes as a guest. <laughs> Next thing you know, he's in the DJ booth. He DJ Red Bull's party. Like, and what like, is happening? Is he pitching himself? Or is DJ, this just like a or is he getting invited or is this just like Lando's at the party and he's been working on his DJ skills? Let's throw him in the DJ booth. Like it has to be that. It cannot be pre planned. If it is pre planned, it's a lot. Like does his is his personal assistant booking shows for him? 
And by shows, I mean weddings. I need to know. It's it's very confusing, but it's clear that it's clear that he is really pushing himself in golf and DJing. The photography is is not there yet. He's a man of many talents. Some would call him the modern day Renaissance man. Oh my god! But he doesn't and, eat sushi. And that's it. That's the wrap on the episode. We can end it right there. He's the modern Renaissance man, but he doesn't eat sushi. <laughs> <laughs> His aversion to fish is just very odd. Like it is as strange as Lewis's aversion to onions. Which I would give up. I would give up the onions. Give me a chance, Lewis. I'll never eat an onion again. <laughs> you could never have an onion either. Like, it's not just, it's just fine. Onions. You simply can never have an onion in your life again. Which I envision May and Roscoe to be really good friends as well. They both yeah. like to sleep. <laughs> I <Hello>. love <laughs> All right, we'll shift back into the the sprint races before we derail everything. But like I said earlier, just this morning, I was literally signing on and I got the ping from FormulaOne.com that the six sprint races will take place next year in Azerbaijan, Austria, Belgium, Qatar, Austin, the United States, and then Sao Paulo. I had to clarify because, you know, it's going to be in Austin. It's not Miami or Las Vegas. And we lost China. China's. So I knew it. I knew it. I told everyone we were going to lose one more race. And now I can officially say, as of right now, it is 23 and 23. 23 and 23. We like that. We like the sound of that. We like the sound of it. We like the ring of it. It just we gives like, keep it. don't, I don't think we'll lose any more. Um, I'm fucking pissed about Qatar after everything that's gone on with the World Cup. I think that's really annoying. And I also think it's really annoying because we've only reset that circuit once and there were a lot of tire issues. So it's, it, look, I fully believe it makes sense to do it at Brazil and at Austin and at Spa. Red Bull Ring, okay. I'm a little worried about like a street circuit because street circuits are all already like kind of notorious for becoming processional not so much baku but if all the moves happen in the sprint race in azerbaijan what's gonna happen in the race granted baku has been known for some interesting drama uh, interesting really the only the only three that i'm like this makes a lot of sense is spa coda and interlagos and I was, I was hoping when that notification popped up, I did my last little fingers crossed moment. And I was like, give us at least one sprint race for the races that we are going to. And I was actually shocked to see Austin on the list. I don't know why, but it was just like, I don't know. I just was not expecting it to be Austin at all. But at the same time, I was like, oh, but it does make sense. Like it is the U.S. Grand Prix. It is giving us North American awesome. folk, the chance to see a sprint. Um, it also yeah. has a lot of good overtakes. So there'll be action there and in the race. The one issue with spa that I did think about, I was like, Oh, wonderful. Another opportunity to sit around and watch the rain fall when the cars should be going vroom vroom. What a joy. Thank you. F1. Thank you. Are you going to make us miserable two days in a row instead of just one? <laughs> They yes. are indeed. They are indeed. It's like, could we stop picking circuits for shit that's important? <laughs> circuits that rain. I, I do, I will say that spa being on there has made me think about going next year because I do want to go to Belgium. I would really have to wrap my head around the amount of clothing I would need to bring on that international trip. 
but it would be cool to see two sprints in a year. Not only that, but the amount of clothing I would want to bring to the track because and how to keep it dry. Because if I'm wet, Megan, you know I'm going to be unhappy. So I'll be in that porta potty changing into a fresh dry outfit. So pack the waterproof backpack and the pants and all the ponchos we own. I just genuinely, I'll be honest, I, I don't like I want to go, but the concept of sitting in the rain again is painful but I, I think i would literally get over that as we get closer to the season i'm just cold right now <laughs> <laughs> i'm cold now so i'm annoyed but give me an hour we'll be fine <laughs> okay so now to get to the meat and potatoes now that we've gotten through the news yes I. are you well potatoes. she called us north american folk and i know saying and now i'm saying potatoes. Meat and potatoes she's really getting into these midwestern vibes it's something about being in the midwest today that makes me proud all right now i've really thrown myself over the edge so you might be wondering what it is we're talking about this episode well at the beginning of the season before it even started megan and i put together our proposed rankings of where we thought the drivers were going to end at the end of the year we are now going to take a look at those proposed rankings and talk about where we went right and where we went really, really wrong. And that's that. So, Megan, let's kick it off with our special additions to the lineup. So yes, this is uh, not something that either of us predicted, um, but we knew that there was probably going to be a random incident where a driver was thrown in. I didn't think it was going to start the season, and we didn't include these in our predictions. So at number 21, we had Nick DeVeers, and at number 22, we had Nico Hulkenberg. So Hulkenberg got zero points. He was in two races for Sebastian Vettel. Um, it was Bahrain and Saudi Arabia because he replaced Sebastian for two races that Seb had COVID. Really, the utility of Hulkenberg being in for Vettel is, is only important because it gave us Australia Seb. I mean, he just had to let all of his feelings, emotions, his shit starter attitude out in Australia <laughs> after he was, you know, not there for the first two races of the year. So... Hulkenberg was the only driver to race in a Grand Prix and not score points this year. Makes sense. The Aston Martin did not start the year off particularly well. And then in number 21, like I said, was Nick DeVeers. He scored one point in Monza when he subbed in for Alex Albon, who had appendicitis and then complications after it. I will say it again, it is really impressive that he scored points in his first F1 appearance for Williams. I don't, I worry that his one-off race success, and I will call it a one-off race success because he was in a Williams, and they struggled for points this year. I want, I, I really hope that that does not cause there to be undue expectations on him going into the year. He is going to AlphaTauri. I do believe that AlphaTauri is going to take a step forward again because this year they've gotten kind of shuffled into the midfield. But I, I really hope that that doesn't lead undue expectations. But we'll see. We'll see. He will have – there will be many rookies next year. So the, the Rookie of the Year award will make sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, and like I was thinking about this, Megan, and I'm like, not only did we not think about if there was an incident who would be on the grid, but the two people that stepped in are now going to be on the grid next year. It is interesting the way it all fell. And yeah. I, I've, I'll say it again about Hulkenberg. I don't know if that was the right move by Haas, but... I was concerned about bringing K-Mag back this year, but I don't think we're going to see a, a Hulkenberg return like a, like we saw the K-Mag return. So then um, 
Number 20 this year was Nicholas Latifi and Katie and I definitely screwed up here. And looking back, I just don't actually know what we were thinking because we actually in our predictions had Guan Yu Zhao ranked behind both Williams drivers. Um, So Guan Yu ended the year in 18th ahead of both Williams drivers. But Katie and I did correctly predict that Alex Albon was going to be ahead of Latifi. And really, I laugh there because no fucking shit. I mean, did anyone actually think that Latifi was going to outrace and outscore Nick, uh, Alex, Alex Albon? Albon? No. If you did, I would like to know what your, your thought process was there because I don't think I have a justification why I would predict it the other way around. No, I mean, even with Alex coming in with a, you know, some time off. I, I was not putting Nicholas Latifi ahead of Alex at all, ever. The thought never crossed my mind. It was it was always Alex ahead of Nicholas, just because we've seen what Alex can do, and I feel like I've never really seen what Nicholas Latifi can do. What's so frustrating about Latifi is he's a nice guy. I imagine he's like very pleasant, very... I imagine him to be very Canadian. And when I tell you that the Canadians are nice, the Canadians are so kind. It's a generalization, but a a positive one nonetheless. But his ability on the F1 track, I just don't think it's there. And he was very, like, you could tell that he was uncomfortable in the Williams all year. He just did not believe in that car. It's really unfortunate that the Williams is where it is because they were the fastest car in the street speed trap. The problem was anything with the turn. (laughs) If it had a turn, it was an issue for them. And if you're new to formula one, every track has a turn. And they're not all left. (laughs) (laughs) So every track was an issue. I mean, routinely every race, they were setting the fastest, Speed in the speed traps, but the car just wasn't there if you had to turn. Just didn't have the grip. Uh, so let's get down to like really how awful it was for Latifi. And it, surprisingly, there there is some redeeming things here. So Latifi only outqualified Alex once, and that was Great Britain. That was also the only race that Latifi got out of Q1. Alex Albon got out of Q1 eight times, and he, um, I I mean, he just had the better pace in terms of qualifying. Um, And then you look at their results. Um, Latifi's best finish was P9, and Albon's was P10, but but Alex did that three times. Latifi's best finish was in Japan, where things got a little jumbled up. We'll say that. We'll say jumbled up. That race was... No, it wasn't Japan. It was Singapore. When it was the rained out race. It was the red flag race. The overnight late night, yeah. The overnight late night. Sorry. I mixed those two up. Um, I apologize for that. But no, that was a, a jumbling, jumbling up. And, and really the best part about Latifi getting points was that it completed my prediction. It did. Megan's prediction of all the... We'll say active in the lineup drivers did score points, uh, which I did not think was going to come true at all. That was that was a wild prediction, but she was right. It made and it it happened. And Nicholas Latifi did it for you. He really did it for you. He decided to show up. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about Guan Yu for a second because I feel like we can't pass him up since we kind of passed him up in the rankings. I think when I thought about Guan Yu and being a rookie, I thought about years previous and how those rookies hadn't necessarily done the best. However, he really showed us what he was capable of literally in the first race where he scored points. And I think if I recall, I think Megan and I hopped on the phone or we were texting and I was like, Oh, we might have been wrong about Guan Yu. He might actually come out here and show us 
show us something his first year. So scored points in the first race. He was in the points three times, and he had his best finish in Canada with P8. And really, I, I, I don't – when I look at the rankings in totality, I thought – VB was going to be much further back. He was going to be in 17th. And so in my head, if the Alfa Romeo wasn't going to take a step forward, I didn't think it was going to like it did. Then Valtteri in 17th, it made sense for Zhao to be in 20th. When I look, when, when I look at that, yes. Then when I actually start thinking about it, I should have never predicted that Zhao was going to be behind the Williams. I really shouldn't have because they truly are, were coming into the season still at a disadvantage. So, like I said, I predicted at 17th it was going to be a Valtteri Botas, and I will fully say that that was a massive miss by me. He ended up 10th in the drivers. Katie predicted Mick Schumacher, but ultimately, 17th went to Yuki, Yuki Sonoda. Sonoda. Yeah, this was... I mean, I will say I was a little close on this one, so, like, not bad, but I put Yuki way further up. I put Pierre Gasly way further up as well. I thought the AlphaTauri was really going to come out and show something this year, to be completely honest, especially after the performance we got from Pierre in 2022. Uh, but Mick, you know, he scored P11 in Bahrain to kick off the season. Then the following race, he had a did not start because of his horrible qualifying crash. He suffered DNFs in Monaco and Canada. And then had a peak in the middle of the season. He had eighth in Silverstone and sixth in Austria. Six was his six was his best finish, took home eight points. But I think like the one thing that I'll take away from the Mick Schumacher moment and where I missed was the way that he was treated throughout the season, especially towards the end with the pressures that were put on him to secure, <laughs> to secure a seat and to, you know, basically be told that he had to show points to keep his seat. And I think those pressures and, um, you know, just the pressure to stay in Formula One didn't bode well for him. And that's where we saw those slips or more of the slips at the end of the season for Mick. What's really unfortunate is I don't really know. I, I wish, let me take that back. Let me, let me reframe that. It's really unfortunate that I, I truly believe that K Mag's success this year was awesome to watch, but it cost Schumacher, his future at Haas, because they saw the difference between the two drivers, which really doesn't make that much sense to me because Mick ended the year 16th, one position ahead of Yuki. They both came in at the same time. And really, when I look at the two seasons between the two drivers, I don't necessarily think I mean, Mick had the better year than Yuki. Hands down. And not only that, but I'll just throw in here, Megan. Like, I felt like the mistakes that Yuki made were more... Childish? I was going to say, yeah, immature. Versus the mistakes that Mick made that were mistakes. I mean, Mick was battling with the Mercedes. That, the the day that we had Lewis H Hamilton and Mick Schumacher battling, I was like, "Here we are. We've got we've got Mick in the Haas battling Lewis in the Mercedes, and he's really not. We don't know what his future. At that point, we didn't know what his future was going to be. Like, I mean, and really, Yuki at seventeenth, it was not like we said it was not where I predicted it. Like, I I didn't call that one at all. I. At all, at all. And I don't know how much a function of that is, like his position is like his kind of stupid mistakes. I mean, him and Pierre did pirouettes together at one point. They ran into each other. He had, Yuki had five DNFs this year. And I, he just isn't putting it together to make, 
to make it happen. Like he has glimmers and or races of success, but then it, it just seems like some is still just jointed. Overall, his best result was only P7, where I mean, like Mick's best result was P6. And I guess like that's not a full indicator of how the season went, but I do think it is like both of them were in cars that weren't that were firmly like in the back of the, the midfield. And it was impressive that Haas moved from the back to the midfield, but it was unfortunate that AlphaTari just kind of like got shuffled into the midfield. I mean, I mean, they just, ugh, when I, when everyone else around you is taking a step forwards and you're not taking a step forward, like the car is going to suffer. The performance is going to suffer. I want to give them an award for being the most bland team of the season. On track. On, yeah, like, I, I I just was expecting so much more out of Pierre, which I can get into a little later. But, yeah, Yuki, I don't know if it's still – he's not on a routine. I don't know if he's still not working out. I don't know if he's – if his head isn't in the game. Um, that makes me want to break out in song. I will not. But it's just there's not that connection there to take him to the next level. Nope. Nope. It's unfortunate. I will see what happens when his contract is up at the end of 23 I, or 24. I believe it's 23, but do not quote me on that. It'll be interesting to see if he stick or, sticks around. I, he needs a, a, a stellar year in 2023 if he's going to move up to a different team. That brings us to number 16. I had mentioned it was Mick Schumacher. Katie had predicted Valtteri Botas, pulled the same issue I did, and I predicted K-Mac. And I don't think that this prediction was a bad prediction. No one thought that he was going to show up and have a P5 in Bahrain after it was like two weeks after he was notified he was going to be in the position after he didn't have an off season with the team. He wasn't doing sim runs. He wasn't in the room with the, he wasn't in the room where it happened. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't in the room talking about the development in the new car until right before the season. He even mentioned his neck was bothering him and no one could have fucking predicted that he would take the first pole position for himself and for Haas It was an impressive year for him. So I don't think my prediction here was wrong. I just, I really believe that at the beginning of the season, there was a lot of questions on if Haas was going to really be able to find pace and if Magnuson was going to be able to fit back into it. Turns out he did. And we'll see him on the grid next year. And it was fucking impressive. The only problem is, is that it, it definitely showed the difference between the two drivers. He out-qualified Mick 16 times. You can't do that. It, if, if you're, if you want to keep your seat, you can't be out-qualified 16 times. Part of me wishes K-Mag came back on a different team. I know, obviously, there wasn't a seat open for him at the time. But I would have loved to see Mick compared to... Nico Hulkenberg, or let me think about this a little harder. I mean, or even, I hate to see him compared to a rookie because that's not necessarily fair, but I think comparing Mick to a Yuki like we just did is a lot more of a on apples par, to apples. apples to apples comparison versus K-Mag who has plenty of experience around. and knows what he's doing a little bit more. Yeah, he's he's been a part of it. He knows what it's like to go a full season in Formula One with the obligations that surround it. He knows a lot of the tracks. It is, I would argue, it is helpful to go to another racing format and not lose it. I'm worried that... I, I worry when people go to another racing format that they can't make their way back, but clearly that's not the case in terms of K-Mag. It does give me hope that Danny Rick could come back to the grid and find success. 
but that is a long way away from happening. I do have some internal thoughts that I won't share yet about it though. This podcast is brought to you by Racing Thread, Formula One clothing for any occasion. Their clothing features subtle, evocative, embroidered designs for your favorite F1 moments. From Ricardo's Monza Shoei to Sebastian's Australian scooter ride. From Lewis's Brazilian comeback to Carlando's round of golf. Whether you're out to dinner with friends, watching the race at home, or cheering in the grandstands, gone are the embarrassing sponsor logos instead racing thread is f1 clothing you are comfortable wearing anywhere right now dirty driving listeners can get 15 percent off racing threads entire range of t-shirts sweatshirts and polos using the code dirty driving that's dirty driving all capitals no spaces for 15 percent off their entire clothing range head over to racingthread.com to shop f1 racewear for anywhere. In 15th, we had Lance Stroll. I had predicted Esteban Ocon and Megan had predicted Yuki Tsunoda in P15. For SC Bestie, We'll get into him a little later once we get to his spot, but I'll just say this for now. He really stepped up this year. He ended up P8, and I completely lowballed him. But from what we had experienced in the past with Esteban, <laughs> it was it was where I threw him. And I... I apologize to Esteban because I feel like I let some personal views of him get in the way of where he should have been in the rankings. I'm a, I'm a validate it and say, I I don't really think we knew what was going to happen with the Alpine. It was a big question mark there, especially going into the season and having like management changes To me, it wasn't necessarily that ridiculous of a prediction to have him that low. Thank you. I'll justify that. Didn't seem like going into the season, there were a lot of questions there. Honestly, when I realized that Lance Stroll was in 15th, I'm a little bit like, dude, daddy owns the team. What the fuck? It's either daddy owns the team, I'm just going to fuck around, or... Daddy owns a team. What the fuck are you doing? I mean, it just, I, his name was only tied to incidents this year. I mean, it was in Australia. It was him and Vettel. Then we have, um, in Coda, we have him and Alonzo. They're what we do have some good overtakes. He definitely pulled some good overtakes, but overall, like the real highlight when I think about, Lance Stroll's year is him deciding to have sex appeal in a cowboy hat and a white tee. I cannot believe you just brought that up again. I just lost my mind for a moment. I mean, right. Like when you think about the highlight for Lance Stroll this year, it was that. Agree. Agree. That and sitting in P10 way more than I thought he did. Yeah, he was like, what? He was in P10 five times. I think so. His best result was Singapore in sixth place. And then he was in P10 a smattering of times. Six. Six times. Six times in P10. His average race result is 10th, makes sense, as opposed to Sebastian Vettel's average race result, which was ninth. So they really weren't that far apart from one another. But I mean, the Aston Martin showed up with the sexiest fuck car. It was the best livery of the year. The only issue was that the drive of the car was not sexy. It was not. And I pray and hope that next year we get something better out of them so that Lance can be in the 
it's daddy's team and I'm here to perform category and Alonzo can continue to give us his Alonzo ness. <laughs> <laughs> I just dropped my pen. It's fine. Um, problems in the morning. Okay. So then we had 14th, which was Pierre Gasly. Katie predicted Lance Stroll and I predicted Mick Schumacher, which I fully admit was a vote of concept a vote of confidence and really it was an emotional vote so there is that <laughs> and now i get to talk about pierre gasly because overall i had him a little higher up in the finish i had him in the top 10 i believe yep i had him in p8 and i like i said earlier i mentioned it i was expecting way more out of him compared to based on what we got in 2022. I really thought we had the fire beneath him. I felt that Yuki was going to step up and be not more of a team player, but like, you know, support him in being on a routine and getting things together and, you know, being supportive in that light. So overall, to put it in simplest form i'm disappointed in pierre's results this year his best race result was a p5 at baku so we did see him get up there but in the start of the season he had three dnfs and really hung out in the like upper to mid midfield for most of the rest of the season i was also I will say, like, I was expecting, we mentioned it, I was expecting more out of the Alvatari itself, but they kind of just fell back. And as other people were developing, they weren't developing, and they fell into this mid to lower ranks of the midfield. So I, it's, like, sad for me to say this, and it it would hurt if I was on the Alvatari team, but I think, like I said, my overall word for them is disappointed. I mean, I thought Pierre was going to be ninth, which again was maybe emotional, but he is a much better driver than 14th suggests. I really hope that they, the Alpha Tar, and now, well, I really hope Alpha Tar takes a step forward, but I really hope that his new place at Alpine is a better fit. And if, I, I think it really, it will be in terms of the car will be able to perform like he wants it to be able to perform. And then in 13th, we had K, K Mag. I, I mean, I say that and I pause because I really truly, I put drivers where they were based on the cars they were going to be in and not thinking they would take a step forward and not be able to maximize potential. So uh, when I say that, I, I mean, I had Lance Stroll in 13th and I just genuinely didn't imagine the step up from Haas and I didn't imagine that K Mag was going to be ahead of them. Yeah, I had Fernando Alonso, who, you know, it, it, we'll get into him in a little bit. I don't want to steal the spotlight from where he actually belongs. But I had K-Mag predicted up in P10. I thought he was going to come in, swoop up a ton of points, give us – he gave us that pole position. But, like, I was just like, he's back. He's hungry. He wants it. And then I had to remember, or I didn't remember at the beginning of the season that at the end of the day, he is on Team Haas and that might not be possible. So we're going to go ahead and put an emotional stamp on that one and, and not a factual stamp. And then we get to 12th, which was Sebastian Vettel. And Katie and I weren't far off from this. We both predicted that Seb was going to be P11. That's actually where Daniel Ricardo, Ricardo ended up. He was 11th. To me, this doesn't feel like we were super off base here. Um, I mean, it was one shuffling. And, I mean, we correctly predicted that Sebastian Vettel was going to be ahead of his teammate, Lance Stroll. Which, I mean, they are like a fifth, sixth team. So this, see, like, in terms of numbers, this is where they should be, or Seb should be, 11th or 12th. Sebastian really 
would probably be in 11th ahead of Danny Ricardo if he hadn't have missed out on those two races because he would have scooped up probably some potential points in that at some some time or another. At least I hope even though the Aston Martin was not where it needed to be, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if the car had made it to the end in Bahrain and Seb was driving, he wouldn't have gotten points there. But his best result this year was P6 that both Baku and Japan and this year was just dominated by him leaving. That news changed. I definitely think how I viewed the rest of the season, it made me much more thankful that we were going to Coda and I was going to be able to see him. It also made me really happy at Coda when he had that battle with K-Mag to the end. I loved the drag race across the line with Alonzo in Singapore. It is really sad that Vettel will not be on the grid next year. I have been pulling a mind fuck on myself, I guess is what I'll call it. There's a better word for it, but I'm at a loss of that word right now. And I have just told myself that it's nothing to worry about. It's nothing to be concerned about. It's not sinking in anytime close. And then next, next March when we're at, preseason testing and you know all the news is rolling out and there's nothing about Sebastian Vettel that's when I'm gonna allow it to sink in and that's when I'm gonna be like oh you've been pushing it off for this long and now it's even worse <laughs> <laughs> and then Megan and I made some mistakes here with Daniel Ricardo. that's the best way to put it um I had Daniel Ricciardo. I believed in him so much. And we, I believed in McLaren. We wanted it so bad, too. But we had Daniel Ricciardo up in predicted of P9 and P8. He ended in P11. He simply did not have it in him this year. And now that we know more of how everything unfolded, I understand why he didn't necessarily have it in him this year. But it's just... Utterly sad that potentially his last two years in Formula One, if, you know, he doesn't get a seat back, have just been bad and sad and time spent at McLaren. And now he's, now he's gone for, again, fingers crossed, everybody right now, we're doing a fingers crossed moment that he will be back. He will return. His average race result was 11th, which... Makes sense because he ended Makes up 11th. Makes sense because he ended up 11th. But also kind of shocking. Shocking because of how high it is. Yes. Because when He's I only read... only on the point seven times. When I... And all this year was dominated with the, the difference between him and Norris. And when I replay his season in my head, it's for sure lower than P11. So the fact that he even eked out P11 to me is like, oh, it's an impressive moment considering everything that has happened this year with him and considering that he hasn't had it in him this year. It just wasn't there. And you could tell it wasn't there. Like things were just not clicking. He couldn't get the car. Like in it, McLaren didn't have the pace this year. They were definitely behind Alpine. Um, the only reason that was called into question was the reliability factor that existed for Alpine. But McLaren didn't have it this year. And Lando was able to extract performance when Daniel couldn't. So the times when Daniel couldn't even get out of Q1, Lando was, was making the lap happen. I don't know if that is a function of they completely set up the car to be for Lando. Is that a function of he didn't trust the car? Is that a function of, you know, he just was really kind of done with the team and their, like, attitude? I, I don't know. Or, or is it a – it's probably a combination of all of it. But it is probably healthy for him to take a year off. I mean, and now he's a third driver at Red Bull. And Checo picks, pisses off Max and Christian one time. He could be out. And maybe it'll happen – Right before Las Vegas, and Daniel will get to race in Vegas. <laughs> I think we just allow, like, a third runner for Red Bull in Vegas. Or or let him drive the safety car. 
Now that would be wild. Danny Rick safety car moment. He can even wear his Red Bull jumpsuit. I won't even get mad. Number 10 is Mr. VB. And we've said it before. We'll say it again. We definitely miscalculated on VB. And I should not have counted him out, but I did. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Valtteri. This is on me. Like, can we be friends still? It's kind of, I feel like I have to make like an apology tour here. He just, he this year he became an icon. He definitely came into his own. It's very clear that leading a team is what he needs to be doing. I definitely think a lot of Zhao's success is not attributed to VB, but is in part due to VB's leadership in the team and mentorship. That's what I say. I think they do have, from everything we see, seem like they get along really well. They have a good partnership. But he had a good year, all in all. Even, even in the, well, okay, he had a good year overall, on average. His best result was P5 at Emilia Romagna. He did go 10 races without points from Canada where he finished P7 to Mexico, where he finished P10. So if that middle chunk hadn't happened and he had been just like picking up a smattering of points, he definitely would have been higher. But I don't really know if that slump in the middle is necessarily a function of his performance or all of the cars around him caught up. Because the Alfa Romeo started as the lightest car on the grid. They were the closest to the minimum threshold that you could be. And so there wasn't a lot of development room in terms of shedding weight where other cars had a lot of weight to shed. The first four races were dominated with us being like, which car is going to get stripped of paint this week? (laughs) I mean, by the end of it, was the Ferrari more red or more carbon black? Questionable there. But unfortunately, that didn't give Alfa Romeo the development room. And and really, at the end, we saw a slight upswing with Botas back in the points for Mexico and Brazil, but not really like a, a resurgence in pace or performance. So they definitely need to take the season and really... Um, evaluate it. I I would also say that having an unreliable engine wasn't great as well because Valtteri did have six DNFs on the season. So um, if, if Ferrari can come out with a great engine, like rumors are circulating, I could see them. If they can get their aero package right and they can figure out how to sh- – Maybe not shed any more weight because they're at the weight threshold. We'll see what happens. But I would not count him out for for next year. In P9, we had Mr. Fernando Alonso. I had predicted Daniel Ricciardo and Megan had Pierre Gasly. But now we get to focus on the daddy of the grid. Yes, I'm still calling him that. My apologies, everybody. He is the daddy of the grid, and yeah, that's because you can't of his deny age. It. Yeah, you cannot deny it. So this man gave us a best result of P5, not once, not twice, but three times in Silverstone, Spa, and Brazil. He had a front row start in Canada, which was phenomenal to see. But the main and cringe-worthy. thing... And Yeah, but the main thing we have to talk about is the fact that he lost anywhere from 60 to 80-ish points based on six DNFs that were all due to reliability issues. And the cherry on the top of it was his Abu Dhabi DNF, last race of the season. It just, it put a nice period at the end of the chapter for the 2022 season for Fernando Alonso. Most of these DNFs, were all from point scoring positions. So we could have seen him a lot higher than P9. It's himself. Truly, he should be ahead of Esty Bestie. And S- so Esteban ended eighth. Um, this is where Katie predicted Pierre to be. This is where I predicted Daniel to be. <laughs> Whoopsies <laughs> on that. But really, Alonzo should totally be ahead of Ocon. 
And really the, the massive differentiation between the two is the two DNFs for Ocon to the six DNFs for Alonzo. Another thing is all of Ocon's two DNFs for reliability, just like we saw Alonzo's being plagued by reliability. Alonzo was the better driver of the two this year, full stop. I mean, we saw him battling with Lewis in the five cars within 20 meters in Silverstone. We saw him drag racing with Vettel to the finish. We definitely saw some X. I mean, we saw Alonzo have the incident with Stroll and then fight back in the U.S. Like, there was... There were a lot of really great moments. And I'm not saying that Ocon didn't have some good moments, P4 in Japan. Um, he also, Ocon is the only one to have, or him and Max Verstappen are the only ones to have incidents or to have DN, to not have DNFs based off of incidents. So um, look, I, I, it's just really unfortunate. And I think playing into this unfortunate game is we, we've we discussed it in the previous episode, but the relationship between Ocon and Alonzo absolutely falling apart at the end of the season. Not only did they have tough battles against each other and were told not to fight, but the comments that came out following that really showed what was going on back at base camp and what was happening behind closed doors that finally seeped out into the public. I'm just like, I I have two concerns is their partnership fell apart at the end, like real, real fell apart at the end. And now we have Ocon and Pierre partnering and they have some bad blood. I don't believe it's just over a girlfriend that seems really childish. And then you have Alonzo with Stroll and, and, and that is the partnership that I think is going to be more interesting to watch because Alonzo was off offered the multi-year contract. He was offered the money that Alpine wouldn't give him to go to Aston Martin. Aston Martin is looking for someone to who has a history of success and competitiveness and the ability to score points. But is Aston Martin going to be okay with that at the detriment to Stroll? Because it is daddy's team. And I, I say that and I say it again because – it means a lot. It means a lot. They had the incident coda between the two of them. And while I don't fully, like, I don't believe that that incident is going to cause strife in the beginning, it will. What happens when the two of them are battling it out? Who's the team preferring? It should, it should be the better driver. Lots I, of question marks there. I am so concerned to the point where it, makes me shake my body <laughs> violently shakes when i think about both of those partnerships next year but specifically like megan said the alonzo stroll partnership because what's zaddy gonna do we don't know no idea in p7 we had lando norris and i for some crazy wild reason predicted that correct megan had sergio perez in p7 but let's dive into Lando Norris real quick. So he had his best result, P3 at Emilia Romagna. He is the only one outside of the top three teams to be on the podium this year. So he is literally the best of the rest. He may hate that name. Most people but it may is hate literally him. true. Yeah, but it, it's it's true. Sorry, you're literally the fact. best of the rest. You're number seven. That's that's all that matters. You're number seven and you're best of the rest. He did not necessarily have the car behind him to get up there and challenge them more often. But like we said earlier, compared to Daniel and compared to, you know, what he was able to get out of the car, he did really well this year. After Austria, so starting in France, he was in Q3 every single time and he out qualified Daniel. 20 times so definitely the better driver this year definitely the best of the rest and i will be very intrigued to see how he does next year partnered with oscar piastri and to see how that partnership goes as well because they literally if, look like the same human 
Thank you for stating that, Megan. I have been putting them side by side in my brain, and I'm like, why do we have the two brown hair, lighter brown eyed, lightly tanned, same height boys on the same team? It's Zach Brown has a type. He definitely does. <laughs> I mean, I do think it's pretty <laughs> comical that I put Checo in seventh. And I really thought that they were going, I, I, okay, look, my logic is true. My logic is true of why I put Checo so far down. I thought that they were going to compromise Checo's season for Max, and they did. I just didn't account for the fact that the Red Bull was going to be that fast. So the logic is true. The positions are not true because I thought Checo was going to be seven and I had Max in third. third. So Max ended up first, Checo ended up third. I thought that it was going to be three and seven. So the logic is there. I just didn't account for the straight line speed of the Red Bull. Oops. <laughs> so in six, we had. Lewis Hamilton. I predicted Charles Leclerc and Megan predicted Lando Norris. Look, I fully, fully stand by my prediction of Lando Norris. I was just off by one position. It was a little bold to put him ahead of Cheka. It was a little bold, but I went bold. I went bold. So Lewis Hamilton in sixth place is actually a mind fuck <laughs> because he had 10 podiums. One more podium than both Ferrari drivers. The only difference was is he had no wins and he had no pole positions. He spent the first half of the season focusing on what the hell was wrong with the Mercedes and trying to figure out how to extract performance with it. Whereas George Russell was able to find that performance earlier in the year. And Lewis Hamilton took a lot of third place podiums. He was just collecting third place trophies, which when you look at the Merck, it's fucking, imp I would say that George Russell and Lewis Hamilton are the, the most impressive partnership of the year because they were in a car that literally the team did not understand. They went with a very different philosophy of the zero side pods. They spent, what, the first, like, 12 races dealing with the car porpoising at very high speeds and having to turn the car down so that the drivers could even make it. At one point, we thought Lewis Hamilton wasn't going to be able to race after Baku because it was so bad and he was in so much pain. Do we honestly think he wasn't going to show up for the next race? No, but it was it was there. But really, the Mercedes spent a lot of time of their season developing to fix porpoising and not developing for, like, to battle Mercedes, uh, to battle Red Bull and Ferrari. So, yes, Lewis is at 10. Uh, yes, Lewis is in sixth, but I fully do not believe that he deserves sixth. It's just very unfortunate the way it happened. Probably partially due to losing points at spa with his incident with Fernando Alonso and Abu Dhabi, which was a retirement based on reliability. It was the only reliability retirement of Mercedes. So they win in terms of reliability for the year. George Russell had no retirements because of reliability. Lewis had one and it was Abu Dhabi. So if they can find the pace and the performance, I think they're back on top next year. In fifth, we had Carlos Sainz. I had predicted Sergio Perez, and Megan had predicted Charles Leclerc. So, interesting choices <laughs> that we made here. I really thought Carlos was going to have it over Charles. I did, too. So, we were both in that boat of Carlos had it. And I think... Long-term, he will. Long-term, he will. And... Had he not had the same number of DNFs that Alonzo had, yes, six, most of them not even finishing the first lap of the race, <laughs> I think he, no, not I think, I know he would have been ahead of Charles without those six DNFs. And 
again, the ones that happened without finishing the first lap, not all his fault, not all on him. That's just the way the cookie crumbles some days. But he did take his first ever race win in Silverstone. Megan just did a silent scream, if you couldn't hear it. We I was so into it. I was thriving that day. The we... Great British Race Off was my highlight of the season. I might go watch it. I'm going to rewatch it today. Fuck it. I'm rewatching it. Whole thing. Not the race in 30. Whole thing. The whole Be on thing. the couch alone. No one speak to me with the dogs. <laughs> Sounds like a, I don't know what it's like there for you, but it looks like it's going to be like a rainy, snowy day here. So that sounds like a perfect activity. Will I, will I watch the Lewis Hamilton double overtake into the Carlos Sainz victory? Yes. Will I cry when they put Charles on a three-stop strategy? Yes. But (laughs) will I feel a lot of emotions? Yes. And am I going to be mad about it? No. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, all in all, Carlos. I'll give him the better performer of the year, but again, with those ZNFs, there was there was no way he was there was no way he was passing Charles. Unfortunately, there was like long periods of time where he had only completed one lap. I mean, I Australia, felt- Emilia Romagna, he completed one lap in two races. Japan and Coda, one lap in two races. Like he spent a lot of time at the track, but not racing. Yeah, like th- oh yeah, it just I would have been bored. I would have taken up another hobby. He's over here not doing anything, and Lando's got three hobbies. He could have had seven by now, but oh He well. was in the golf simulator, Katie. He was on his phone practicing his golf swing. Or playing chess, you know. One of the, one of the two. I mean, he is like the old money zaddy of the grit. Like, I play chess. I play golf. I like red wine. <laughs> I'm beautiful. My hair is perfectly combed over, even after two and a half hours of it's racing. It's perfectly quaffed. It's got a perfect <laughs> quaff to it. I love when he takes his helmet off and the hair is like this combination of like sweaty, gross, but like also perfectly untamed. You're like, that is un- that is tame to untame. It gives like post-battle helmet takeoff, if you know what I mean. Or yeah, like, like James Bond vibes. Yeah. But longer hair. I really, really... Okay, two things. Segways, side note. I am so upset that Lewis Hamilton wasn't in Top Gun Maverick. But I fully believe that Lewis Hamilton will be in a feature film and have a prominent role post-Formula One life. But the bigger thing is I fully think that Carlos Sainz could play James Bond. I mean... My mouth just... Hit the ground. He is the only driver on the grid who I think could play James Bond. I'm thinking. Based off of like I'm looks. thinking. I'm thinking. I think you're right. I think you're spot on. I would say like Charles would make a pretty good James Bond villain. Like he's got the looks for that. Like. You know, he just I was gonna say Max Verstappen would be the James oh. Bond villain. Yeah, I kind of looks like an owl. I kind of forgot they about could, Max. He, he, his his James Bond villain name could be the owl. That sounds owl. like a James Bond villain name. Let's write the story. Spectre, send it in. Owl, Doctor No, Goldfinger. There you go. Yeah, we know our James Bond. Shout out to our father. I mean, honestly, literally. Max Verstappen could be Goldfinger. He wore a 24 karat gold helmet. He wore gold shoes. He likes gold. And now he can enjoy all of his gold in his penthouse multi floor <laughs> palace in Monaco, which sounds like a James Bond villain lair. It does. All right. You've sold me. Let's write the story. Let's send it off. But you know who's going to play the vampire? Is our next. It's not George Russell. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because in number four, we had the vampire himself. Second vampire only to Total Wolf. I will say that. Total Wolf is the vampire. Total Wolf is the head vampire, and George Russell is his vampire in training. I will give you that. <laughs> but in fourth, we had George Russell, Mr. Consistency himself. Megan and I both predicted this correctly. It's the only one, I believe, yes, that we both predicted correctly. And... We were spot on because 
George came out and just absolutely crushed it this year, showed us what he could do, took his first win. I his could, first poll in Hungary. I could not have asked for anything more from that man. I mean, he was the street sweeper of the season. Just like, I don't have a fast car, but when the top two teams have an issue, I'm going to show up and grab points. And and fully, his his position comes from the win, where he got the, the points for the win. But it also comes from the fact that he was in the top five, 19 out of the 22 races. He was just nabbing points wherever he could. He had eight podiums, which is two less than Lewis. So I think he definitely had a very impressive season. Don't get me wrong. I don't think anyone thought that he was going to be ahead of Lewis, but that didn't really account for the lack of pace that the Mercedes was going to have. When I think about who was overall the better driver this year, I would have to give it to Lewis over George Russell, but, 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 I think it is much more impressive in terms of like he showed up having come from Williams to Mercedes and is basically like on pace with Lewis in terms of qualifying and race pace. I think next year we'll kind of flush out that story a little bit more as Mercedes now understands the car because Lewis in the beginning was all focused on how the fuck do we make this car fast? Where... George was like, here's what I've been given. Let me get what I can out of it. And so they were kind of in two different mental games. It also, George Russell had one DNF in Silverstone because of an incident that he caused where he squeezed Gasly, um, but he did not have a DNF based on reliability. So overall, just his ability to be in the top five so much on literally math purposes only, I think is how he got so high and really how he got ahead of Carlos Sainz because I, I, you got to give it to, you got to give it to George though. I mean, he got a pole position in Hungary when they still didn't understand the car. Do they even understand it now? He was the horse whisperer to his car this year. I, like that's just it. He is extracted everything he possibly could out of it. And that's what gave us the consistency that we saw when he fell out of the top five, we were all like in disbelief. Shocked. We were all shocked. We were absolutely, we, it, it was insane. And then before we knew it, he was right back up there. It was a great year for him. I'm really excited for next year. I do fully believe that he is the future of Mercedes. And this year proved that he could do it when Lewis decides not to do it. Granted, I don't think Lewis is leaving anytime soon. I fully expect to have a Hamilton-Russell partnership for a couple of years. In number three, we had the Minister of Defense himself, Sergio Checo Perez. I had predicted Carlos Sainz and Megan had predicted Max Verstappen. So let's talk about Checo a little bit to feign the choices that we made. Checo, my dude, obviously second to Verstappen in most things, but second to Verstappen in the number of podiums he received. He stood on podium 12 times this season, taking two victories, one at Monaco, thanks to the crash at the end of Quali and question capital mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question, question mark. mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. I am not commenting either way. And nothing will ever be proven. No. It, conversation has happened and now we are past it. It we're off to a new season. It's, it's whatever Max needs to figure out what his issues are and move on. And then he also won in Singapore. So all in all, I'm going to give him it was a great year. He did everything I expected him to do. I expected him to finish second to Max. I expected him to give up things for Max. I expected him to be the team player that he was last year. Uh, and I'm sure that's exactly what we're going to see next year. And as long as Checo is happy with that, which I don't think he is most weeks, but he does it anyway because he's a Red Bull driver, then that's what we're going to see. 
it's just very unfortunate that in the end, with as great as Red, with as impressive as the years Red Bull have that I did not predict, I'll be honest. I didn't think they were going to come out that strong. Um, I also didn't think they were going to violate the cost cap. Oh! oh. I'm going to sip on some tea. So um, I, I think it's really, the, the biggest failing of Red Bull this year is not doing everything they could to make sure Checo could have gotten second in the drivers. And that's a function of just compromising his race and really Max throwing a fit. Granted, I fully am aware that math says that if Max had given it up in Brazil, it wouldn't matter, but it does kind of still matter. Like I said, Checo lost out to P2 in the drivers to Charles Leclerc. And and Charles had a rocky year. Uh, he had an impressive year in terms of result at the end. I don't necessarily think he had an impressive year when you look at the, when you look beyond the P2, when you look into the beyond, <laughs> it's not there. He uh, had three races. He had nine podiums, which is one less than Lewis. And it's actually the same number of podiums that his teammate had. He had nine pole positions, nine pole positions, the most pole positions on the grid. He is the best qualifier on the grid. He could make things happen at the 11th hour in his last Q3 run and put it on pole. The reason I say when you look beyond his P2, you see that those nine pole positions, he had the track position, but it was a Ferrari and Charles Leclerc failure to convert that position into race success and, and truthfully, more podiums. And, and that was a combination of tire management. He was up against Max Verstappen, who had excellent tire management. Strategy mistakes. Three stop in Silverstone. Putting on hards when he wanted mediums. Yeah. And ultimately, I, I, at the end of the day, a lot of his own mistakes. He had three DNFs this year, but he laid a lot. He made a lot of mistakes. Not all of the DNFs were based off of his own personal mistakes, but like in Brazil, yes, he went into the barrier. Yes, he kept going. Yes, he fought back for positions, but if he hadn't gotten in the barrier, what could he have done? Monaco, Ferrari dropped the ball on a one-two strategy that left Charles Leclerc in fourth behind, Car Car behind Carlos Sainz in P3. I already mentioned Silverstone and that fucking three-stop strategy. And and yes, his teammate won, but at the detriment of their their championship leader potentially winning. And then Emilio Romagna earlier in the year, he literally like spun and lost positions. Like he just was he went for too much. He went over the curb, spun, and he went from like P2 to P5. So it was all those little, a little, little moments that that added up to be like, yeah, on paper, it looks good, but it was just rocky. And I really don't know what Ferrari are going to do. I, I've said it once. I'll say it again. I fully believe that I don't ever think that Charles Leclerc is going to win a driver's championship because I don't think he has it where I, as opposed to that, I think Carlos Sainz, we could see it. And, and that's what I thought was going to happen this year. I thought Carlos Sainz was definitely going to be ahead of him just because I, I, I just fully believe that. I don't know if it's just like their driver instincts. I don't know if it's watching them. I don't know if it's seeing the little mistakes that, that Charles makes that prevent him from reaching success. It'll be interesting next year with a new team principal. Yes, he has now gotten rid of his team principal, and he's also gotten rid of his girlfriend. So there are two I, changes in his life that... Was there per some personal shit going on this year? I do think it's a little strange that they were making out in Abu Dhabi after he took P2, and then he, three weeks later, calling it quits. It feels like an about face. Granted, we don't know what's going on in their personal lives, but that could have been weighing on him more. I mean, maybe Charles is going into his my girlfriend is my car arrow like Lewis Hamilton. Lewis, when you're ready. Megan's here for you. I'll quit onions. <laughs> Katie will also quit onions. Happy to. Happy to quit onions. Except for under my spinach and artichoke dip, but 
he doesn't need to know about that. You will literally, you could literally eat that on a different continent from him. I could, I could, you're right. Okay. <laughs> you're right. To sum it all up, we had Max Verstappen in at number one. I predicted this. Megan had Lewis Hamilton. For some reason, I knew it. I don't know what more I can say, but I think I knew that he was going to be after fighting for a championship win without an asterisk next to the name. However, here we are with the cost cap, but I'll just leave that there for everyone to decide if that's an asterisk or not. Uh, so I, I was definitely worried at the beginning of the season, absolutely concerned for my predictions after the double DNF for Red Bull in Bahrain and then the DNF for Verstappen in Australia. Both of them were reliability issues, so I was like, is this the year that Red Bull sucks again? Who knows? But it was not. It was not. They came back strong, had great consistency leading most, if not all, races, and had no DNFs due to incidents, which is a huge improvement for Max compared to years previous. His best but race... But Katie, he was, like, out front with no I one know, around no him. I know, no one around him, so I... There's I mean, asterisk. the literal, the there's literal, an asterisk next to that too. Okay. I mean, Max Verstappen won by like a fuck ton of points, right? Like I can't tell you the number. I'm not looking at the numbers, but he won by like well over a hundred points, right? Like literally his win in the driver's championship is like how every race was like, okay, bye Max. See you bye. later. We're going to have a race behind you. Yeah. So again, another asterisk on, on a statement about Max Verstappen. But he did take 15 wins. He had 17 podiums, and there were only five races without him on the podium itself. So he did it. Red Bull did it. Max did it. That's that's a wrap on that. That's all we need to say about Max. Unless Megan, you have anything else you would like to add about Max? But we will. Okay. Can oh, you can't discount that he had an amazing season. Yeah, he did. And really, I don't think. A lot of people would criticize his driver performance this year. I think they would criticize his personal performance and kind of some of the bullshit that happened. But but none of that really has to do with what he did on track, other than Brazil. So you got to give it to him this year. I, I did not, I fully did not think that Red Bull was going to find success this year. I, I don't know what to say about next year, though. I mean, they are at a massive disadvantage in terms of wind tunnel time, but they do have the AlphaTauri wind tunnel. I know you're not supposed to share information. Whatever. They have Adrian Newey. I would not, they they will not be out of the top three fight. I do hope that we see more race winners that are not named Max Verstappen next year. Well, it was nice. Actually, no, I'm going to take that back. It was not nice to have the championship wrapped up that early. I wish we could have seen a battle to the end like we had in the previous year. And I really hope, I think my biggest hope for next season is that it comes down to a battle between three drivers on three different teams or even three drivers on two different teams truly battling it out for these podiums and for these wins, and there isn't a 10 plus, 15 plus, 20 second plus gap between the leader of the race and second position. I hope the, the winner's crowned in Vegas, because why the fuck not? That would be wild. That would be wild. I'd fly out to I Vegas mean, as soon as the race was over just to be there for the after parties all Sunday. It would just be really, really wild. I, um, it'll be an interesting year next year. I think I am more excited and more anxious going into next year, the second year of the regulations than I was this year. I'm not saying that this wasn't a great season to watch. It was definitely a very different season than last year. I think after 2021, we all were really struggling to understand how this year was going to go. Uh, 
The new regulations have clearly worked. There are many more overtakes this year. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but a significant more number of overtakes. My only wish is that the podiums had been a little bit spicier. Like we'd seen like an Alpine podium. I, I really thought we were going to get another one-off random person on the podium. And it really was just Lando Norris. Not that I'm unhappy about that. I am interested to see how Netflix wraps up this season. Uh, I will say it. Uh, rumor has it there's three Red Bull episodes, which seems a, a bit uh, aggressive. But I, it, really, is it that aggressive when they won 15 races or they won 17 races this year? I forgot to add Checo's wins. Oopsies. We'll yeah. see. It was a year. It was a year. It was a year that we are so thankful for. At the end of the day, we made it through a season. We made it through a season as podcast hosts, a full season. And we are so appreciative to all of our listeners for coming with us on this journey. This episode does wrap season two of Dirty Driving. Woo woo. And it wraps the 2022 season of formula one which was trauma induced silly season nonsense (laughs) is silly season over yet (laughs) technically i don't think so (laughs) we'll be asking that question for years to come so will it just blend into next year's silly season it'll all just be like two years of silliness theoretically it's done theoretically it's done the grid is set Logan Sargent has picked his number at number two because number three was taken. So, um, and with that, like, we'll see you next year, everybody. For more ridiculousness. <laughs> Keep an eye on our socials as we will be posting in the off season. But again, thank you so much. And until next time. Stay, stay dirty. dirty. Thank you so much for listening to another episode. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us at Dirty Driving Pod on Twitter and Instagram. Until next time, stay dirty.